Hairballs and Loops Why understanding the real world is important, but not easy. By Levine van Zon. Stories are important for how we see the world. In my first episode, I argued that stories act as internal models of the world, supercharged by our ability to share them with others. My subsequent post was about complexity and about science. Although much of our knowledge comes from the pursuit of science, its tools have trouble with so-called complex systems. Complexity in this context means that there are many interacting parts. The parts of a complex system are hard to separate because their interactions are significant. They cannot simply be ignored or averaged away. So far I have been a little vague about a number of things. For instance, what do I mean by stories, internal models and knowledge? And what is the nature of interactions between the parts of a complex system? In this episode, I want to make some of these things more concrete. Also, I will show that complexity isn't just there to make our lives difficult. It can actually have an important function. Let's start with the concept that stories are models of the world. Stories are complicated things that are closely tied up with the workings of our mind. They are hard to define and they serve many functions. So for now, I will just focus on a common experience. We generally feel that we understand an event if we can construct a coherent story of how the event was generated. Such explanatory stories are often not accurate, of course. Our explanation of an event may be quite different from how the event was actually generated. But regardless of their accuracy, the collection of cause and effect stories that we believe to be true does constitute our personal knowledge, our internal model of how the world works. Because a fair number of our causal beliefs are at best inaccurate and at worst plain nonsense, it is useful for a society to have some way to check our shared beliefs. Science can be seen as a collective human effort to figure out whether cause and effect stories, usually called theories or hypotheses, actually correspond to processes in the real world. And it turns out that this is not at all easy to establish. The way to test a causal story is typically through experiment. If we change something in the proposed causal chain, we should see a change in the effect. However, it is not always possible to perform direct experiments. For instance, things can be too small or too big to manipulate, like molecules or societies. Or they may be connected to too many other things, as with cells in the human brain. Luckily, people have come up with many ingenious and elaborate ways to establish which causes lead to which effects. Ideally, we are able to figure out a detailed mechanistic process. By this I mean a description of all the steps through which certain causes lead to certain effects. Knowing the true or at least likely mechanism through which something happens is what we usually regard as understanding in the scientific sense. Having such a mechanistic description is very powerful as it may allow us to control things and predict what may happen in the future or in other hypothetical situations. As I discussed in the previous episode, the classical scientific approach has difficulty with complex systems, because such systems have many significant interactions between their parts. For instance, in the human body, in human society, or in a natural ecosystem, it is hard to manipulate and study parts in isolation. This would be necessary to clearly determine cause-effect relationships, and understand how such relationships work. Yet if we isolate parts, we change the system we want to study, Moreover, cause and effect may not even be well defined, because there may be causal loops or feedbacks. Let's look at an example to make clear what I mean. Imagine a small greenhouse containing a simple ecosystem with three kinds of organisms. Plants, slugs and hedgehogs. This is a very simple, complex system. It is not hard to describe the interactions here. The slugs eat the plants and the hedgehogs eat the slugs. These interactions are significant in the sense that they are literally a matter of life or death for the parties involved. Hence, this system is complex in at least two aspects. Interactions are significant, and the parts thus behave differently if you separate them. Whether specific interactions are positive or negative depends on our perspective. Clearly, the slugs negatively affect the plants, but we can also say that the plants positively affect the slugs, and indirectly the hedgehogs. For an outside observer, the two ways of seeing the interaction are more or less equivalent. For the plants and slugs, they are not. While the interactions are easily described here, the behavior of the system is not so easy to describe in terms of causes and effects. 
What happens, for instance, if the slugs eat all the plants? There will be a brief explosion of slugs, and perhaps hedgehogs, after which all animals will die of hunger. But while such a slug Armageddon is certainly possible, the little ecosystem can also be perfectly stable. The hedgehogs can keep the slugs in check, giving the plants an opportunity to grow, and the limited number of slugs will in turn limit the hedgehogs. As you can see, there are loops of causality here. The slugs affect the hedgehogs, which in turn affect the slugs, which affect both plants and hedgehogs, and so on. This is an example of circular causality, or what are often called feedback loops. Feedback loops can be tricky to describe, because there is no clear separation of cause and effect. Do the slugs limit the hedgehogs, or do the hedgehogs limit the slugs? The answer is yes, they limit each other. The relationship between slugs and hedgehogs is an example of what is called a negative or balancing or attenuating feedback. A familiar example of negative feedback in human engineering is the thermostat, which turns up the heating if it becomes too cold and turns it down if it becomes too warm. Negative feedback is in many ways positive, because it can prevent things from getting out of hand, so it tends to provide stability. The other common type of feedback loop is called amplifying, reinforcing, or simply positive feedback. As you will probably have guessed, positive feedback isn't always positive. An example is the rich get richer effect. People who have more money have more opportunities to acquire further wealth than people who have less money. Therefore, the rich tend to become richer and inequality in societies will tend to increase unless active measures are taken to prevent the concentration of wealth and power. Positive feedback is very powerful. It drives exponential growth and can rapidly amplify things. But in the absence of stabilizing mechanisms, it potentially causes instability. We depend on it for our nervous and immune systems to function, among many other things. And it drives biological evolution and economic growth. But it can also lead to explosions, economic depression, ecosystem collapse, runaway climate change and social revolutions. Back to our little greenhouse. Because normal human language is imprecise and has difficulty with circular causation, there is a limit to how well we can describe what goes on in this small system. This is despite the fact that our greenhouse only contains three species, and our story ignores many other things that are also important, like the sunlight, water, nutrients and microbes that are required for the plants to grow. Our description doesn't provide enough information to predict, for instance, whether a given constellation of slugs and hedgehogs will destabilize the system by eating too much. For this, we will need a more precise description of what is going on. One thing we can do is construct a mathematical model that describes the main interactions between the three species. I will not bother you here with the details. You can see what this looks like in the footnotes of the article on my website, if you're interested. Suffice it to say, a mathematical description is much more compact than our descriptive story, and it allows us to make very specific predictions. We can use it to determine how much the animals can eat, or how fast the plants need to grow, for the system to remain stable. In this sense, it is a richer description, although to make the mathematics manageable, it also leaves out a lot of details. These details may or may not be important for the questions we want the model to answer. Like our descriptive story, a mathematical model is a simplification. In many ways, it is a very poor description of what actually goes on. All our models, whether stories, pictures, mathematical formulas or computer simulations, are tools for understanding the things that happen in the world. They are necessarily simplifications, and they are never as rich and subtle as the real thing. Now imagine trying to understand and describe an actual natural ecosystem that isn't an artificial greenhouse with only three species. Puget Sound is an estuary in Washington state, adjacent to the cities of Seattle and Tacoma. In my online article there are pictures of what it looks like, and of some of the creatures that live there. There are fish, Caspian terns, that's a bird, harbor seals, plumos anemones, and there's the geoduck, which isn't a duck. In the article there's also a picture of the main species groups and their interactions in the ecosystem. This food web diagram looks like a giant hairball, in which every species seems connected to nearly every other species. Clearly, this is a more complex, complex system than our greenhouse. Even though the diagram in the article is still much simplified, human language is no longer an effective tool to describe all the interactions that it shows. The diagram actually represents a computer model, which in turn is based on a mathematical description of relations between groups of species, such as what and how much they eat.
These numbers in turn are based on observations and measurements of what actual creatures do. You can imagine how much work goes into constructing such a model. And this is not even a very complicated system, as ecosystems go. Moreover, the model mostly describes relatively big organisms. It lumps the huge diversity of microorganisms, which constitute an ecosystem unto itself, into a few large groups, such as bacteria and phytoplankton. Now imagine trying to make a model of what goes on in the human body. The Puget Sound ecosystem model describes 65 species groups. The human body consists of roughly 30 trillion cells of more than 400 different types, plus another 38 trillion or so microbes belonging to more than a thousand different species. Our own cells interact with this personal ecosystem of resident microorganisms in ways that are essential for our health but are poorly understood. Furthermore, the internal workings of our cells depend on more than 80,000 different proteins and on a lot of other types of molecules, many of which we don't know anything about yet. Much of what goes on in our body is decentralized and self-organizing, although some of it is coordinated by our nervous system, which has somewhere in the order of 100 trillion neuronal connections. The human body is so mind-bogglingly complex that there is no way a single person could understand how it all works exactly. Luckily, we don't need to know all the details in order to operate our body. But for medical science, this complexity does present a problem. In fact, we almost always see complexity as a problem, and with good reason. If we want to control things, we need to know how they work, at least more or less. If you want a doctor to treat a serious medical condition, it helps a lot if they know what causes the condition, and what happens if you treat it with a certain pharmaceutical drug. Of course, trial and error can be a valid approach. But it is much more useful to know causal mechanisms, and as a patient I would much prefer this. And luckily we do know quite a few mechanisms, the exact processes by which certain things happen in our body, often down to the level of molecules. But figuring these out has taken a gigantic, time-consuming and very costly effort, by millions of researchers collecting data and doing experiments for more than a century. And given how much we still don't know, the end of this effort is nowhere near in sight. One of the problems is that merely collecting detailed information isn't sufficient for understanding how things work. As science writer Philip Ball points out in his book How Life Works, it clearly isn't the case that all details matter. If all details were important, life would be utterly fragile in the face of disturbance and damage. But life is remarkably resilient, so buried somewhere in the endless complex details, there must be robust patterns and processes that keep things running even under difficult conditions. If we collect a lot of detailed observations and focus mostly on these, we easily lose sight of the big picture. We risk missing the forest for the trees, missing the patterns and processes that actually matter most. Unfortunately, it isn't always clear where we should look for these aspects that matter. For several decades, it was believed that for living beings, genetics is what matters most. This is an understandable belief. Genes contain much of the information that we pass on between generations, and this gets acted on by evolution. So surely our genome must provide a kind of blueprint for how to build an organism? If we can just understand how to read and interpret this information, then all the other messy molecular and cellular details may prove less important. Or so we believed. The Human Genome Project started in 1990. It aimed to read all our DNA so that we could catalogue our genes and associate them with their function. But when the first results came in, a decade later, they were quite different from what was expected. It wasn't a neat picture of genes determining certain functions, or even mostly encoding protein molecules with clear functions. Rather, our genetic content seemed a bewildering mess of Baroque complexity. Even two decades on, it's still unclear what most genetic elements do. In the years after the first genome datasets were published, the messy data did turn out to contain patterns. For instance, some combinations of genes were found to behave in ways similar to electronic circuits. Such biological circuits often have clear functions. They can oscillate or switch between states in various ways. These circuits are very common in single-celled organisms, but alas, much less common in humans and other multicellular organisms. The wiring of the molecular network encoded by our genes actually resembles the brain more than it does a set of simple circuits. An electronic circuit processes electrical signals. Similarly, our molecular networks also seem to direct and process information, encoded in chemical, electrical and mechanical signals. 
but the information doesn't neatly flow in one direction or stay in one part of the system. Instead, like in the brain, the information seems to go everywhere and it can have effects all over the organism. How can we make sense of this? Why is our body, and that of other multicellular organisms, organized in such a strange and seemingly chaotic and inefficient way? Is this just the historical legacy of millions of years of random mutation? Perhaps some of it is an evolutionary legacy, but certainly not all of it. Rather, it probably isn't a coincidence that chemical interaction networks in our body show similarities to the way our brain is wired. Our neural networks are wired to integrate and process information in ways that are relatively flexible and robust. These networks need to be somewhat insensitive to noise, damage and small details. The same is probably true for the molecular networks encoded by our genome. Individual genes do have an effect on the way information is processed by these networks, but the effect is typically small and often it's hard to predict beforehand what the effect will be. The fact that most gene mutations have only minor effects provides the system with some degree of robustness. This also makes the process of evolution a lot easier, and the unpredictability of the effects is an advantage given the existence of viruses and other pathogens. These parasites constantly try to co-opt our molecular machinery for their own purposes, and this would be a lot easier for them if the workings of our biology were transparent and predictable. All living beings have to survive in a world that is full of noise, variation and elements that can inflict damage. If our biology was sensitive to all of this, it would never be able to build a well-functioning complex individual from a single cell and make it last for 80 years. So what does all of this tell us about how we should deal with complex systems? First, it seems that the role of details in such systems is complicated. If we ignore details, we risk coming up with mystical cause and effect stories. Such stories have no clear mechanism, no clearly defined process through which causes lead to effects. It may take away our uncertainty to attribute effects to deities, the universe, black boxes or invisible hands. This in itself can be useful. We dislike uncertainty, and even false certainties may aid us in many ways, for instance by binding social groups together. But often, vague mystical explanations don't help us in solving the actual problems we face. For this, we need a mechanistic understanding of the processes through which things happen. And to understand such a process, we need to know about relevant details. If we say, everything is connected, this may be true, but it doesn't further our understanding. To understand, we need to figure out which connections are actually important and how they influence the behavior of a system. But even if we do this, we should be aware that our knowledge will always be incomplete we will usually oversimplify and miss connections that are important in a certain context. Moreover, as I said before, if we focus mostly on details, we may lose sight of the bigger picture. Especially when dealing with living systems, we need to zoom out occasionally and wonder what a system is supposed to be doing. What are its goals? Which things matter for this? And what is their context? In a living system, the way in which details relate to the whole can be compared to the structure of human language. If you focus just on letters or on letter shapes, language seems a bewildering mess of small details. It isn't until you zoom out to words that things start to make some sense. But to fully comprehend language, you need the words to interact with each other and with grammar in sentences. These eventually interact with our mood, knowledge and experience in paragraphs and stories. Words and letters do matter in all of this, but the sentence can remain comprehensible if we remove or substitute words. And words can remain comprehensible if we change or remove letters. Moreover, entire languages can evolve significantly and rapidly, while still remaining functional. Like language, the way in which life works has to be both adaptable and robust. Details do matter, but it is hard to say beforehand which details do and which don't one has to comprehend the larger scale patterns to understand the role of details. Finally, we need to realize that what we often see as messy, inefficient complexity can actually have a function. We tend to dislike complexity. It makes things harder to understand, manage and optimize. We prefer clear chains of cause and effect, which we can more easily communicate, understand and modify. When confronted with a complex system, we mostly seek to make it simpler. But in evolved living systems, complexity is a feature rather than a bug. Of course, good design doesn't have to be complex, 
but it needs to be both robust and adaptive if it is to survive in the long term. The essayist and mathematician Nassim Nicolas Taleb has gone a step further and proposed the term anti-fragile. This describes things that do not just persist under adverse conditions, which is robustness, and are able to recover, which is resilience, but that actually require some adversity to function well and get better over time, which requires adaptation. We humans are quite good at optimizing things for a narrow set of functions and conditions. We often design structures that seem efficient and in which causes and effects are easy to understand. But these structures also tend to be fragile, especially when conditions are no longer optimal. If we remove or damage any part of such a fragile system, it no longer works well. On the other hand, when we design things to be robust, we tend to do it by over-designing. We make a best guess of worst-case scenarios, say the maximum strain a bridge has to endure. Subsequently, we apply a safety factor. We design the structure so that it can withstand two or three times the worst-case strain. This approach works well, provided, of course, our calculations are correct, the scenarios don't become outdated, we didn't overlook possible causes of failure, and the structure we design is well maintained. Naturally evolved systems seem to do something quite different. They tend to have many complex causal loops that are hard to understand. But such loops do have a function in stabilizing the system and in making it less sensitive to noise and damage. Such systems tend to be robust, if they weren't, they wouldn't last very long in a world that can often be adverse and unpredictable. They are able to recover from damage and adapt relatively quickly to new conditions. Having anti-fragility built into a system nearly always makes it harder to comprehend. In the words of the late James C. Scott, it is less legible. Still, this approach is often more efficient and is certainly more adaptable than over-designing structures with large safety margins to obtain robustness. And a dynamic anti-fragile approach is certainly more robust than designing systems that are so streamlined for efficiency that they fail at the least sign of trouble. We over-design bridges, power plants, cars and aeroplanes, which is good. We streamline our supply chains and our food production systems, which is worrisome. If we seriously want to make our societies and our infrastructure more sustainable in the long term, by which I mean longer than a few decades, we will need to broaden our view to how life does things. We have currently organized our societies in ways that will probably not fare well under big changes of any kind, especially if such changes are sudden and unexpected. Life has survived such challenges many times, and some past societies have done so as well. It would be wise to learn from the design principles and processes through which living systems manage to persist, rather than to assume that we know better or to ignore such mechanisms altogether. At the very least, we should start to accept and appreciate complexity. We should pay more attention to patterns and processes that provide robustness, such as negative feedback loops. But we can do much better. Perhaps we can learn to use some of the principles of adaptive, anti-fragile complex systems in ways that are beneficial to the long-term well-being of humans and non-humans alike. This concludes the reading of Hairballs and Loops why understanding the real world is important, but not easy. Do you want to be notified when future articles in this series are published? Subscribe to my Substack, lvzon.substack.com. Also, if you are interested in further reading, notes and illustrations, you can check out the full article at lvzon.substack.com or at sustainsubstance.org.